the legend of the Bermuda Triangle. It's one of the few mysteries we still can't solve. Let's rewind back about 600 years. The story begins with an Italian man. He wanted to sail across the ocean to reach Asia, a continent rich with spices, silk, minerals, you know, that kind of stuff. Getting there by land would take ridiculously long, so he figured, hey, uh, why not to build some sturdy ships, uh, gather a couple of sailors, and set off to Asia? What could go wrong? That man was Christopher Columbus, by the way. In 1492, with a little help from Spain's royal family, he embarked on his journey. Everything was going well. I mean, apart from totally going the wrong way. But as he got to the end of his voyage, he noticed something very strange. He didn't know it at the time, but he was sailing through the infamous Bermuda Triangle. The BT, the point of no return, the scary place between Bermuda, Puerto Rico, and Florida. There are loads of stories of ships, boats, and planes disappearing into this mysterious realm. Some were found years later, and some disappeared off the face of the earth, lying undiscovered at the bottom of the ocean. Maybe. We know one thing for sure, we have no clue what's going on over there. People have been trying to figure it out for years, but nothing. Zip. Nada. So what was it that Christopher Columbus saw that fateful evening? What freaked him out so bad? According to his logs, Columbus saw a huge flash in the sky. I don't care how tough you are, if you're sailing around with no clue where you are, and then you see a massive flash right in front of you, <laughs> you'd find me hiding below deck, chewing on a lemon or something. That's not the only sea mystery out there, not by a long shot. Heard of the Kraken? A giant squid that can swallow a whole ship. No? <laughs> you're lucky. Imagine cruising on a ship, wind in your hair, hands on your hips like, you know, those old pirate movies. Then a huge squid creeps up on you from deep down in the cold, dark water. It wraps its tentacles around the ship and drags the whole thing to the bottom of the ocean. Good thing you packed a life raft. How about a colossal sea serpent chasing your boat at full speed looking for a midday snack? That thing is called a leviathan, and you better hope it's not real. Or sirens, mean but beautiful creatures of the sea. They like to hang out on rocks and sing karaoke. Their magical voices attract sailors who sail their ships right into the sharp rocks. Now, mermaids, on the other hand, oh, totally awesome. They like karaoke too, but they're not into the whole ship smashing thing. Good old mermaids, <laughs> they're real, right? And let's not forget, peg-legged pirates. Arr! Lootin', raidin', sayin' arr every two seconds. Arr! What else do those guys do all day? So, back to our Italian friend, Columbus. Maybe he just saw a thunderstorm. <laughs> Duh! Why didn't he think of that? Well, I'm not 600 years old, and I wasn't there. How on earth would I know? Weird thing is, he never mentioned any huge waves or heavy rain. No strong winds, either. Just a single flash in the sky. Maybe some dolphins were setting off fireworks or something. After the flash, Columbus wrote that his compass needle started dancing all over the place. This keeps getting weirder and weirder. His report ends with a friendly turtle with sunglasses jumping out of the water, pushing the three ships to shore, and everyone went out to get hot dogs. Only kidding. So what happened? Scientists now think they've got the answer. Drum roll. An asteroid crashed into the ocean. Case closed. But wait, what about that stuff with the compass? What does that have to do with an asteroid? Asteroids come in all different shapes and sizes, but they're like chocolate eggs, the best parts on the inside. They're packed full of minerals and metals worth trillions of dollars. Scientists are even trying to figure out how to land on a big one and mine it. It'd have to be a really big one. I'm talking about an asteroid the size of Rhode Island. Why? Because chances are, it'd have a magnetic field around it, making it way easier to land on. Scientists think that the magnetic fields around some asteroids can last for millions of years. Mystery solved. Maybe. Captain Christopher Columbus's compass went cuckoo crazy because of an asteroid crashing right in front of him. That actually might explain some other strange Bermuda tales. About a hundred years ago, the USS Cyclops left Barbados on its way to Baltimore, 
and sailed right through the middle of the Bermuda Triangle. It never arrived. Search teams spent ages looking, but they couldn't find anything. It just vanished, just like that. In 1945, five military planes vanished without a trace. They flew right over the Bermuda Triangle. So if there is an asteroid sitting at the bottom of the sea somewhere, why is it still causing problems 500 years later? Radar and old school compasses rely on the Earth's magnetic field. Radars, how they track flights all around the world. A faulty radar reading? That would be a problem. Try putting a magnet near a compass and see what happens. The compass needle is its own little magnet, always pointing north. But if you put it next to a strong enough magnet, the needle will spin around to face it. What if that compass is all you've got to guide you to shore? Chinese ship captains were the first to invent compasses. Before that, people used to sail along the shore, or just to islands that they could see. Having compasses meant those early sailors could write down where they went, so other people could get there too. So now that we have all this new tech, the question is, is that asteroid even still down there? How would we get down there to find out? It wouldn't be the first ever deep sea dive. We've already been down the Mariana Trench, the deepest one on Earth. The Mariana Trench makes climbing Mount Everest look like a joke. Only two people have ever been down there. Because it's so deep, the water pressure is insane. The only way down is in a high-tech tank, something that won't crush in on itself under pressure. And that kind of thing doesn't come cheap. Down there, just a lot of darkness, quiet and beauty, and a bunch of weird animals. The Bermuda Triangle isn't as deep as the Mariana Trench, so we might get down there one day. We might see that asteroid that Columbus saw, this time with millions of tiny fish on it who've made it their home. All those lost ships and planes that disappeared should be down there somewhere. Or we might see something we were never expecting. We might find ancient species of squid, sharks, and turtles with special skills like night vision. We might find gold. Loads of ships full of gold and silver sank on their way back to Europe from the Americas. Some wrecks had evidence of fire. Some were split in two. Most of them are still out there. Japanese divers once found an ancient underwater pyramid-looking thing. They don't even know for sure if it was natural or man-made. Up in the Baltic Sea, someone snapped a bizarre sonar image of... a spaceship? Or just a strange-looking rock? A Swiss lake was hiding a sweet vintage car. After it was dragged to shore and cleaned, it was sold for over $350,000. And the tires still had air in them. Japanese fishermen once found a small round boat that had a glass top on it. There was a red-haired woman inside. Some thought it was a fairy tale come true. Some thought she was a magical creature. And some thought she was a spy. The Bermuda Triangle sounds scary, but the islands near it are awesome. Bermuda is a tiny island where they speak English, and the other points of the triangle are the tip of Florida and the American island of Puerto Rico. In 1945, five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we all go down together. And then, static. The five planes and their 14 passengers were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. In March 1918, Carrying a crew of 306 people, the USS Cyclops left Barbados 
and headed home to Baltimore. The ship passed through the Bermuda Triangle on its journey and was never seen again. The Cyclops never issued any distress signal and disappeared without any explanation, making it the largest ship to go missing in the Bermuda Triangle. No wreckage has ever been found. No one exactly knows how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the US on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. William Shakespeare's famous play, The Tempest, was inspired by the Bermuda Triangle. Sailors returned home to England to tell stories of treacherous waters near the Bahamas where ships mysteriously disappeared. These stories made it back to the bard himself and inspired his final play about a storm at sea transporting a ship to a mysterious land. The shipwreck in Shakespeare's play is based on the 17th century ship Sea Venture. The ship was carrying supplies from England to Virginia when it was struck by a massive storm in the Bermuda Triangle. Sea Venture was battered by the storm for three days and barely made it to the shore. Survivors of the wreck were stranded on a desolate stretch of Bermuda for nine months. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. A huge investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. Because the Bermuda Triangle isn't a recognized place, no one knows its exact location or size. Some people believe it covers around 500,000 square miles around the Bermuda area. Other people believe the triangle is as big as 1.5 million square miles. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. The Bermuda Triangle is home to the deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, the Milwaukee Deep. The area has a maximum depth of over 27,000 feet. This is one of the deepest points in the ocean floor, but still not close to the massive 35,000 feet of the Mariana Trench. But the huge depth might explain how such little wreckage has been found. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. In the year 1800 again, the ship USS Insurgent was on patrol when it stopped briefly at a coastal base before heading back out to sea. That was the last time USS Insurgent was ever seen. A severe storm reportedly struck the West Indies around that time. It's believed that storm was so powerful, it could have caused the sinking of both the USS Insurgent and USS Pickering, which vanished around the same time. Like the Pickering, no wreckage of the insurgent was ever discovered. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves that reach up to 100 feet tall. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. 
These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. Joshua Slocum was an extremely talented sailor. He was the first person to ever sail single-handedly around the world. But sadly, he was no match for the Bermuda Triangle. In November 1909, Slocum said goodbye to his wife and set off on one of his usual winter voyages to the West Indies. Slocum's wife reported him missing after several months passed without any contact. It's said that he called in at Miami to resupply before vanishing into the Bermuda Triangle. Just off the coast of Japan, you'll find the Bermuda Triangle of the Pacific Ocean. They call it the Dragon's Triangle. Between 1950 and 1954, nine ships disappeared in this area without leaving a trace. The ship Kayo Maru 5 was sent to investigate these unexplained disappearances when it also vanished. After this incident, the Japanese authorities labeled the area as a danger zone and sailors are encouraged to avoid it. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The United States Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in the Bermuda Triangle for the past 15,000 years. In July 2015, two teenagers disappeared after setting sail off the coast of Florida. There's some mystery about what the two teens were really getting up to. They told their parents that they were just going to fish, but they told their friends that they were crossing to the Bahamas. Shortly after they left, a line of thunderstorms moved towards the area and the boys were never heard from again. A massive 15,000 mile search was conducted, but sadly, nothing was found. One year later, the pair's boat was found off the coast of Bermuda with a broken iPhone and some personal effects left inside. One of the most popular and bizarre theories trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charles Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. More than 50 ships and 20 planes have disappeared here since the middle of the 19th century. You won't find this place using an ordinary paper map since it's not an official region of the Atlantic Ocean. It's just a small area of water in the shape of a triangle, located not far from the southeastern coast of the US. In the 20th century, this place became a legend. Some believe it's home to a secret base. Others are positive it's a time portal. Ships get caught in a strong storm and move to the past or the future. There's also a theory that the city of Atlantis is located right under the Bermuda Triangle. Its technologies create bursts of energy and destroy ships. Even airplanes have a chance to disappear in this area. All this has gone so far that if something strange happens in the ocean, everyone thinks it's somehow connected with the Bermuda Triangle. The fear of the triangle has been made popular through books and movies. Directors, writers, and journalists like to use this theme. But in their works, you only see a few correct answers. You can find the truth about this place yourself if you look closely. But first, let's refute the weakest theories. Space objects, Atlantis, time travel, all these myths appeared in the middle of the 20th century. There weren't any records about mysterious phenomena before this time. People just noted that a lot of ships were sinking here. But then, one author wrote a book about Atlantis lying in the waters of the Triangle. The author didn't provide any evidence, but he described this hypothesis very convincingly. People read it and liked it. The human psyche likes to read something secret. When you learn something that no one knows about, it makes you feel special. And of course, you begin to believe in this secret. 
So, this was one reason why the Bermuda Triangle book has become so popular. It brought the author a lot of money, and other people also wanted to enrich themselves the same way. Some other fantastic theories about time travel and secret bases have appeared since then. After that, people started making documentaries. All those works devoted to the mystical nature of the Triangle were based not on real facts, but on theories from other books. It's impossible to find the truth in this chaos. Some people like to learn secrets, even if they're fake. But you can always find the truth if you really want. Just take any myth and try to find sources proving its reality. Most likely, you'll find nothing but non-scientific books and movies. There are also more realistic things about the Triangle, but they are no less interesting. One hypothesis says that ships disappear there because of methane. Deposits of this gas are under the seabed of this region. Sometimes it releases from there and rises to the surface. As soon as methane comes into contact with water, it takes the form of giant bubbles. Then these bubbles foam the water and create large waves that flip the ships. This theory is quite real, and such a natural phenomenon exists, but not in the Bermuda Triangle. None of the numerous studies have confirmed the presence of an increased concentration of this gas here. The last methane eruption occurred here about 15,000 years ago. Another realistic theory is rogue waves. They form without storms and winds. The calm water surface can transform into a big wave, the height of a five-story building, in three seconds. It sinks a ship and then quickly disappears. The sea is calm again as if there were no waves at all. Some scientists believe a surface sea current colliding with a strong headwind creates this phenomenon. But some recorded cases involved no wind. Another version says the wave is born thanks to the collision of warm and cold currents. But the most exciting theory talks about kinetic vampirism that forms the waves. Under certain natural conditions, waves get the ability to exchange kinetic energy. And among all the waves, there will be the biggest, the vampire one. It absorbs the energy from all the others. When the power is accumulated, the vampire wave splashes it out. This explains the force of the impact and its sudden disappearance. All theories seem logical, but scientists still can't figure out the nature of this phenomenon. Yes, rogue waves can carry ships underwater, but not only in the Bermuda Triangle. They rarely appear in all the waters of the world's oceans. So let's move on to the next theory. Some of those who sailed through this place reported their navigation devices had become unstable. The compass and electronics broke down. The signal and radio communications were lost. We need to look at the triangle from space to find out the reason. If you use special sensors and devices, you'll see that the Earth's magnetic field is weakened above the Bermuda Triangle. This field is a shield that protects us from solar radiation. The ISS astronauts said that the triangle gets more of the sun's particles than any other part of the planet. Therefore, electronics are unstable in this area. But such failures don't occur with satellites and other space objects flying within our planet's atmosphere. Areas with a weakened magnetic field appear all over the world, and they hardly ever disrupt navigation. This means that ships and planes work stably in such conditions. But all the same, a compass doesn't work correctly in the triangle area. Could it be that some magnetic anomaly affects the navigation systems? This theory was quickly refuted. Scientists regularly check the magnetic map of this region and don't find any deviations from the norm. The reason for the unstable functioning of a compass is not an anomaly. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the few places on the planet where the true north and magnetic poles coincide. True north is the geographical north pole. The magnetic pole is constantly moving around the globe directly to the north. Sometimes these poles collide and cause such a phenomenon as agonic lines. If you fall under this line, your compass will behave strangely and won't point you to the true north. That's why so many ships disappeared in this place at the beginning of the 20th century. People used an ordinary compass. They didn't have modern navigation technologies, and the misfunctioning of the compass could have led to disastrous consequences. Imagine that you're a ship's captain in, let's say, 1901. Your compass is guiding your way. 
you know you always need to sail north to get to land. Then you get into the Bermuda Triangle. You look at the compass and notice the arrow position has slightly changed. Now you need to move in another direction. This direction is the wrong one, but you don't know about it yet. You take the wrong path and end up in the Caribbean region. This area is full of tiny islands, and the seabed is not deep here. Your ship gets on a shoal. You're stuck and have no idea where you are. That's how some ships disappeared in this region. But if you had GPS, you wouldn't have lost your route and would have sailed safely to land. By the way, now in the 21st century, you can use a compass here without problems, since the magnetic North Pole doesn't meet the true one on the territory of the Bermuda Triangle anymore. The agonic lines are somewhere else right now. But still, for some reason, ships get lost here. And now we come to the most unexpected solution to the Bermuda Triangle problem. Yes, boats sometimes disappear in this region. And the reason for this is... Water, ocean, nature, call it whatever you want. Unfortunately, ships sink all over the world. Don't be afraid of just one triangle. There are places in the Atlantic Ocean territory where more boats disappear. And the Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of them. But why does no one know about them? Well, it's because people wrote fairy tales about one particular place. One of the most popular ship routes of the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. Can you guess where most shipwrecks occur statistically? In a place with many sailing ships. That is, in this region. The only true statement about the Bermuda Triangle is frequent storms. But even bad weather and a raging sea doesn't always sink ships. Also, hurricanes often form in the Triangle territory. The Bermuda region has high atmospheric pressure. This pressure diverts storm clouds away towards the Triangle. Strong winds and large waves can sink ships, and lightning flashes can damage planes, but this is not unique. So don't blame the Triangle for all the problems. It's a beautiful and picturesque place that attracts many tourists. The Bermuda Triangle is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the Bermuda Triangle mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night, when he was on the deck of the ship, he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he'd ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. No one exactly knows how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. A huge investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves that reach up to 100 feet tall. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. Just off the coast of Japan, you'll find the Bermuda Triangle of the Pacific Ocean. They call it the Devil's Triangle. 
Between 1950 and 1954, nine ships disappeared in this area without leaving a trace. The ship Cayo Maroon 5 was sent to investigate these unexplained disappearances when it also vanished. After this incident, the Japanese authorities labeled the area as a danger zone, and sailors were encouraged to avoid it. Some people blame all disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Bermuda area. This gas tends to set off, and when it happens, bubbles start forming on the surface of the water. These gas eruptions can interrupt the ability to float and can easily sink a ship. Because of this chemical reaction, there won't be even a trace left. Underwater volcanoes are said to be another possible explanation for the Japanese Dragon's Triangle. In fact, they can take down even small islands. Luckily, nobody lives there. It's a pretty common thing in this area that some of them disappear underwater and others appear out of the blue because of seismic activity. You'll never find the Dragon's Triangle on any official map of the world, so nobody's quite sure about how large it is in reality. In July 2015, two teenagers disappeared after setting sail off the coast of Florida. There's some mystery about what the two teens were really getting up to. They told their parents that they were just going to fish, but they told their friends that they were crossing to the Bahamas. Shortly after they left, a line of thunderstorms moved towards the area, and the boys were never heard from again. A massive search was conducted, but sadly, nothing was found. One year later, the pair's boat was found off the coast of Bermuda with a broken iPhone and some personal effects left inside. One of the most popular and bizarre theories trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charles Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. Previously, the compass wouldn't work well in the Bermuda Triangle since the lines of the two poles coincided here – true north and magnetic north. But if you fall into this line, your compass will behave strangely. But the magnetic north is constantly shifting, and now it's far beyond the triangle. No legend says pirates of the last centuries operate in the Bermuda Triangle, or that the Flying Dutchman makes other ships disappear. A popular theory is that ships travel to the distant past or future through a time portal in the Bermuda Triangle. Fortunately, these are all myths. Just imagine hundreds of giant tentacles reaching out to a group of ships sailing through the Bermuda Triangle. In the past centuries, they could easily sink an entire fleet, since the ships were made of wood and were lighter. Squids wrapped decks with their strong tentacles, made holes in the ship's hulls with their sharp beaks. Toothy suction cups could break the masts and tear the sails. The water was filling the holds and slowly rising to the deck. The ship sank in a matter of minutes. Survivors reached the shore and told everyone about huge monsters. This is how the legends of the Kraken appeared. Fortunately, now people have sonars and equipment for monitoring the sea space. They say the main reason why this place is so enigmatic must be the magnetic fields that form this ominous triangle. Ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to the high concentration of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. Magnetic fields tend to shift their position, so do tectonic plates and even the continents, even though we never notice it. The skies are usually very clear there, but back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Seems like the Bermuda Triangle has an alternate not only on Earth, but even in space. Spacecraft usually don't disappear into thin air, though, like there's no air. 
This anomalous area is really large and stretches right above the South Atlantic. It occupies the area from Chile to Zimbabwe and sits right at the point where Van Allen radiation belts are the closest to the surface of our planet. The Earth has two such belts, which come in handy trapping the particles that shoot in from the Sun. They do a great job protecting the Earth from radiation. The magnetic field there is lower, so it allows the Earth's radiation belt to come closer to the surface. Whenever a satellite passes by, it will be exposed to radiation, which might lead to serious damage. So no satellite can take pictures of it. The South Atlantic anomaly is part of the Earth where natural radiation just flows out of control. Still, there is little evidence that all these triangles are really dangerous. Many believe the Bermuda Triangle itself has been proven time and again to be nothing but a work of fiction. In fact, some shipwrecks, such as the Ellen Austin, gained popularity in the middle of the 20th century, while nobody even thought of drawing a triangle in the Bermuda area before that. The mystery was popularized by science fiction writers and became a common myth, while no serious research proved it any more dangerous than other parts of the world's ocean. So the crew of the Ellen Austin back in 1881 weren't even aware of the Bermuda Triangle back then, let alone afraid of it. What do you think? Hmm, can we estimate how many ships and airplanes were lost in the Bermuda Triangle? Have their disappearances resulted from human error or weather phenomena? Let's try to find out. We have a curious story of the SS Cotopaxi. This ship vanished in 1925, traveling from Charleston, South Carolina to Havana, Cuba. It never reached its destination. Years later, in the 1980s, a wreck was found 40 miles off St. Augustine, Florida. Since specialists could not precisely determine what and where it came from, they nicknamed it Bear Wreck. It took many additional years of work done mainly by marine biologists to identify that this ship was indeed the missing SS Cotopaxi. This was confirmed in January 2020. How did the ship just reappear? And how did it get there, since this mysterious shipwreck isn't even in the Bermuda Triangle? Now, let's see who came up with this term, Bermuda Triangle. Can you actually pinpoint the triangle on a map? No, it's not an officially recognized location either. The Bermuda Triangle does not appear on any world map. Nobody has agreed on its exact boundaries. There were only assumptions with approximations of the entire area, ranging between 500,000 and 1.5 million square miles. By all approximations, the region has a vaguely triangular shape. In 1964, an American author named Vincent Hayes Gaddis first came up with the idea when writing an article for Argosy magazine. He used the Bermuda Triangle to describe a triangular region that has destroyed hundreds of ships and planes without a trace. It is pretty hard to get the number of lost ships and planes because some ships and aircraft have gone missing without leaving a trace. Their wreckage in the region has not been recovered. But the recorded stories should help us. Legends about the Bermuda Triangle date back to the 15th century like that of the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. When sailing through the Atlantic waters, he passed by this location in the late 1400s. In what we now know as the Bermuda Triangle, he saw a huge flame that seemed to just crash into the ocean. Later, he saw an unusual light flashing in the distance at the exact location. Like many other sailors since then, his compass had severe malfunctions. Flight 19, a Navy plane on a routine schedule back in 1945, also started the Bermuda Triangle legend. It was commanded by Lieutenant Charles Taylor, and it's recorded that he just got lost in the triangle for no reason. Since pilots had no GPS back then, they had to trust their compasses and keep track of how long they'd been flying in a specific direction and their speed. Shortly after completing the task, both of the compasses on board stopped working correctly. Records found after the plane's disappearance also indicate that Taylor didn't have a watch on that particular day. The initial report stated that pilot error was to blame for this unfortunate event. However, 
because people weren't satisfied with this outcome, it was changed to causes or reasons unknown after several reviews. One surviving pilot named Bruce Guerin suggested he went through an electronic fog while passing above the triangle, making him travel through time. In 1970, when this incident happened, he was flying his aircraft when it was surrounded by two huge clouds that formed a whirlpool and spiral. Like many others before him, he noticed that his navigation devices were malfunctioning. When he eventually made it out of those clouds, he discovered that his flight had only taken 35 minutes. It should have taken 75 in total. Since he had no other reasonable explanation for what he went through, he believed he must have been pushed forward in time. It's not only strange-looking clouds that have been seen above the Bermuda Triangle. In 2014, a pilot recalled almost colliding with a flying object that he could not identify whatsoever. Some of these strange encounters were even caught on tape. It's the case of an early 2015 flight whose passengers noticed a curious object just floating over the ocean. The pilots have yet to figure out what they actually saw back there. Okay, not all of the possible explanations have been this unusual. Oceanographers, for example, have also tried to explain why ships disappear around here. So they recently came back to one of their old theories, rogue waves. These are immense walls of water that just pop up suddenly. If multiple such waves rise simultaneously, they overlap like a wave sandwich. If one single wave can reach over 30 feet tall and happen simultaneously, it can create a rogue wave that can surpass 100 feet high. These types of waves can quickly overtake even the biggest of ships. Meteorologists came up with their own explanation too – hexagonal clouds. These unusual types of clouds can generate winds of up to 170 miles per hour. And they're pretty significant too some reaching 20 to 55 miles across. As such, waves inside these wind giants can go as high as 45 feet. The Earth's own magnetic force might also have something to do with it. Within the Bermuda Triangle, compasses point to true north, the geographic North Pole, rather than magnetic north, the shifting magnetic North Pole. Some have even explained that since these two perfectly overlap in the Bermuda Triangle, it can cause a magnetic phenomenon that could make navigational devices malfunction. It's called the agonic line. The problem is that scientists have discovered that this line moves each year. It might have passed through the Bermuda Triangle at one point, but it's now through the Gulf of Mexico. Other strange natural phenomenon found along the coast of Norway could help explain why the Bermuda Triangle has claimed so many ships. There are some deep craters there, measuring up to half a mile wide and are 150 feet deep. Scientists believe they were created by methane gas bubbles. This gas seems to be leaking from deposits hidden deep in the seabed. Once the gas reaches a certain quantity, it bursts to the surface and causes eruptions. So, do pilots and ship captains actually avoid this area today? Could this explain why there are fewer ships that get lost there nowadays? But if you've ever flown from Miami to San Juan, Puerto Rico, you probably know that's not true. As for ships, if people would avoid the Bermuda Triangle, nearly all Caribbean vacations would be spoiled. To this day, there are a lot of flights that go over the Bermuda Triangle, so it's clear nobody is avoiding it. This place is one of the most heavily traveled shipping lanes in the world. Nowadays, the Bermuda Triangle has heavy daily traffic, both by sea and air. But the Bermuda Triangle is indeed subject to tropical storms and hurricanes that happen very often. Let's also keep in mind that the Gulf Stream, a strong ocean current that causes sharp changes in local weather, passes through the Bermuda Triangle. Besides, the deepest point in the Atlantic Ocean, the Milwaukee Depth, is also located in the Bermuda Triangle. The Puerto Rico Trench reaches almost 27,500 feet at the Milwaukee depth. So, if you think about it, the whole mystery is a perfect combination of human error, bad weather, and a lot of ship traffic. This was confirmed by data provided by the U.S. Coast Guard. If you look at percentages, 
the number of ships or planes that go missing in the Bermuda Triangle isn't different from anywhere else. Disappearances do not happen more often than in any comparable region of the Atlantic Ocean. Official statistics say around 50 ships and 20 airplanes have vanished while traveling through this region. So that's another reason why the total number is so hard to pinpoint. Nobody could describe its rescue in official records if a boat was reported missing. There were also some events that, it turns out, didn't happen at all, adding to those false reports. Like that of a plane crash back in 1937 off Daytona Beach, Florida, that local papers surprisingly revealed nothing about. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. A beam of electric light pierces the darkness over the calm waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The Titanic is quietly making its way through the waves, its passengers asleep, when suddenly a monstrous white shape is caught in the light beam. The fateful iceberg is about to rend the side of the legendary ship. April 14, 1912, only two days before someone will take a photo of a giant iceberg with a pretty unusual elliptical shape. It turns out that this iceberg most likely formed out of snow that fell included that the iceberg was probably a part of a small cluster of glaciers in southwest Greenland. These days, it's possible to calculate the roots of such icebergs in any given year in the past. So the infamous chunk of ice was on its way from Greenland to an area further south from Cornwall. If the ship had passed through that region only two days later, the iceberg would have moved far away from the point where they met. At first, the weight of the most well-known iceberg in the world was 75 million tons. With time, it started to slowly melt away. And when it sank the Titanic, its weight was only 1.5 million tons. By the time of the collision, it had probably been melting for months. But it was still a true monster. When the Titanic sank, the iceberg was 400 feet long and more than 100 feet of its surface was above the water. Some people believe it was a supermoon that caused the Titanic to sink. That night, there was a rare lunar event. It hadn't happened for 1,400 years. In normal conditions, the iceberg wouldn't have traveled so far south without melting and losing the largest part of its mass. But the supermoon could have been the reason for an unusually high tide that pulled the iceberg away from the glacier way faster than York, she started filming a movie called Saved from the Titanic almost right away. The movie was released only a month after the Titanic sank. And in the movie, she even wore the same shoes and clothes she had during the actual disaster. The movie was a big success at that time, but the only known copy was destroyed in a fire. 14 years before the Titanic sank, a novella called Futility had been published, and it seemed to have predicted the whole event. The plot centered around a fictional ship called the Titan that sank during its voyage. The Titan was almost the same size as Titanic, and they both went to the bottom in April. The reason was hitting an iceberg, too. Both the real and fictional ships were described as unsinkable, and both of them had the legally required number of lifeboats, which, as it turned out later, we're nowhere near enough. We've seen it in the movie, but there were some real-life love stories happening on the Titanic, too. Thirteen couples even took a trip on the Titanic as part of their honeymoon. One of the couples owned Macy's department store in New York. Once it became clear the Titanic was rapidly sinking, the woman refused to go into a lifeboat without her husband. But he didn't want to join her while there were still women and children who he thought had to go first. Then his wife gave her coat to her maid. She insisted that the maid should get into the lifeboat, and she wanted her to be warm. As for the woman herself, she decided to stay with her husband till the end. Some people believe Titanic sank because of a mummy, not an iceberg. It all started around 1000 BCE with a mysterious woman who lived in Egypt, in the city of Thebes. 
People knew little about her, but they called her a priestess. Her mummy was put in a wooden sarcophagus and covered with a large lid with the image of her face and some mystical inscriptions. This place had been hidden until the first half of the 19th century, when a group of locals accidentally came across it. They disturbed her peace. No one knows how, but the mummy disappeared that day without a trace. A couple of decades later, a group of rich friends from England traveled to Egypt and found the empty mummy casket with the image of the priestess, whose dark eyes seemed to be looking into the void. They decided to buy it, but the buyer disappeared the same night before he even got the case. All members of the group had some accidents. The casket changed its location a couple of times until it, as some believe, ended up on the Titanic. It took more than 70 years for a robot submarine to find the ruins of this legendary ship. The wreck lies nearly 13,000 feet under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, split into two halves. Why did the liner break apart? No one knows exactly. Some think it happened because of the water that got inside when the ship collided with the iceberg. The pressure was so powerful, it separated two parts of the vessel, starting with the ship's bottom structure. Others say it was because of the hull rivets. They had a high concentration of slag or smelting residue. And that's something that can cause the metal to split apart. The ship generally had many flaws, starting with the design. The watertight bulkheads weren't completely sealed on top. This allowed the water to flow between the compartments and, in the end, sink the vessel. The iron of the ship's rivets and steel of the hull ended up ruined because of high sulfur content, cold temperatures, and high speeds. The steel shattered and the rivets popped out quite easily. Because of this, Titanic sank 24 times faster than it would have otherwise. If the ship had hit the iceberg head-on instead of ramming it with its side, it would have probably stayed afloat. How come the crew members didn't have binoculars? It would have surely helped them spot the iceberg on time and maybe even avoid the disaster. But the binoculars on the Titanic were locked in a storage cabinet. Only one crew member had the key, and he had been transferred off the ship right before it set sail. He later said he hadn't remembered to hand over the key. But even without the binoculars, the ship might have had some time to change course and avoid the collision if the crew had gotten some warning. But that's the thing. Someone did warn them. About an hour before the incident, a ship that was relatively close to Titanic, the SS Californian, sent a message to inform them it had stopped because of dense ice field. But the warning never got to the Titanic's captain. Some experts say it was because the radio operator didn't think it was that urgent. And later, the SS Californian said they didn't get a call for help from the Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Some say the crew on the Titanic couldn't spot the iceberg on time because of an optical illusion. Atmospheric conditions that night probably caused super refraction which could have camouflaged the berg. After all, no one actually saw the iceberg until it was too close to the ship to somehow avoid the crash. Not even a whole minute passed between the moment they saw the iceberg and the collision. It was only 37 seconds, and it took Titanic 2 hours and 40 minutes to disappear below the ocean's waves. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. No one could ever have imagined that the unsinkable Titanic would collide with an iceberg. Except for one man, William Thomas Stead. Well, not directly, of course. It's not like he jolted out of bed one day, envisioning the fall of the Titanic. Rather, he wrote an empowering short story called How the Mail Steamer Went Down in Mid-Atlantic by a Survivor on March 3, 1886, 26 years before Titanic sank. Okay, let's do a super quick recap. Titanic was traveling from Southampton to New York in April 1912 in the North Atlantic. The ship hit an iceberg, and less than three hours later, it was completely underwater. 
Out of 2,208 people on board, just 706 survived due to the limited number of lifeboats and icy cold water. Another passenger ship, Carpathia, heard the distress call, picked up the survivors, and brought them safely to New York. The short story William Stead wrote was about Thomas, a British sailor, who got on a passenger liner bound for the U.S. At one point, the protagonist realized there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone on board the ship in case something happened. A couple of days later, heavy fog covered everything in sight. Luck was not on the liner's side, and it collided with a stray ship, just like Titanic struck an iceberg. Only 200 out of the 916 people made it safely to the U.S. The main character managed to survive by jumping into the water and climbing into one of the lifeboats. Now, you'd think that the story riled up everyone in the industry to add extra lifeboats on ships. But sadly, it received very little attention when it was published. Even more tragically, William Thomas Stead was on Titanic when it sank, and he didn't make it. The survivors who knew Stead mentioned that he had always been cheerful and had loved to chat during meals. He complimented the ship's design and how sturdy it was. Witnesses also talked about how he had been helpful when the ship had been sinking, having given his life jacket to someone else. He was a journalist by profession and was on his way to New York for a ceremony. One of his most important contributions to modern journalism was the use of illustrations in every newspaper article. He also introduced newspaper interviews, and they're still used to this day along with illustrations. But this story wasn't the only published work that predicted the disaster. Morgan Robertson was an author and former ship captain who wrote short stories and novels. His most notable novella is The Wreck of the Titan. It's also known as Futility. The book was written in 1898, 14 years before Titanic. It was a fictional story about the Titan, an ocean liner similar to Titanic, which was crossing the North Atlantic. It's also a coincidence that Titan was just as fast as Titanic and shared many other similarities, like size and design. The book described it as unsinkable and the largest ship to hit the ocean at the time. That's what they said about Titanic, too. Another eerie similarity was the limited number of lifeboats it had. The story took place in April, and that's when Titanic set off on its journey and hit the iceberg. The Titan story also mentioned that barely anyone had survived that horrible accident. Unlike Stead's story, the protagonist of Robertson took a different path. The Titan sinking happened somewhere halfway through the book, so after the accident, the main character went on with his life. The book was brought back into the spotlight after the Titanic disaster. How could someone describe the events that took place almost a decade later so accurately? Many started to believe Robertson could see the future. But the reality was that Robertson knew his way around a ship. It was easy for him to write down the nitty-gritty of things without doing more research. Realistically, one of the biggest threats for ships at that time was hitting an iceberg or colliding with other ships. The next story sounds somewhat mysterious. Once, Alex McKenzie heard a voice that warned him not to board Titanic. But when he turned around, there was nobody there. As he continued walking, the voice spoke to him again. But this time, it was louder and more distinct. He took the warning seriously and decided to cancel the trip and go back to Glasgow, Scotland, his hometown. His grandparents weren't too happy to find him back home instead of on Titanic. After all, the ticket was very expensive. That disappointment very soon disappeared when they heard that the ship had struck an iceberg. John Coffey was a member of the crew of Titanic, but he decided to ditch the ride when the ship stopped at his hometown in Queenstown, Ireland. His inner voice told him to get off the liner, and he did. He was only 23 at the time, and for someone his age, it could be a major career boost and an opportunity to grow. Despite the horrible tragedy, the guy signed to work with the RMS Mauritania just months after the Titanic sinking. Talk about commitment! Some added info was revealed about what may have contributed to the fall of Titanic. The constructors insisted that the ship was unsinkable. But many people later theorized that the vessel's steel plates had been too frail for the freezing Atlantic water. It may have caused the rivets to pop, allowing ocean water to seep inside. 
Another theory is that there may have been a fire in the hull of the Titanic that had been raging for three weeks before the voyage. The fire softened the steel, allowing the iceberg to cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Some pictures before the ship set off on its journey show black marks on the hull, which could have been caused by fire. Either way, the iceberg would have caused significant damage in any case, no matter if there was a fire or not. Some people also blame those who designed the Titanic. The ship was built with large joints at the bottom, which probably snapped easily during the collision. Of course, these are all theories. But we know for a fact that the iceberg was the main character of this drama, and that the works of Stead and Robertson should have been taken seriously. Either way, this should be a lesson for the future, helping to prevent similar tragic accidents. By the way, ocean liners and passenger ships wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for Thomas Newcomet. In 1712, he invented a steam engine that was so strong it could produce enough energy to power a ship. And a century later, in 1819, the first steamship traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to Liverpool, UK. It only took the vessel 29 days to cross the ocean. The passenger ship industry boomed in the early 1900s when it became easier for people to move to America or go on holidays. As decades rolled by, the use of aircraft stole the spotlight from passenger ships since planes were faster and more efficient. Nowadays, it's quite rare for a passenger ship to collide with anything in open water. Modern technologies can detect anything that can pose a threat and even predict stormy weather. Cruise ships these days are giants compared to the vessels of Titanic's era. Modern ships can carry almost twice the number of passengers and have amenities folks back then could only dream of. Most cruise ships these days have several restaurants to choose from, multiple swimming pools, and game rooms to catch a break. If you're in the mood for some fun, you can watch live performances. Don't forget about the helicopter pad, because why not? Don't worry if you start feeling unwell. The in-house doctors are always there to help any passenger in need. And these ships are only going to get bigger. Putting Titanic and a modern cruise ship side by side is like comparing a corgi to a Doberman. Back then, Titanic was the biggest and most cutting-edge vessel anyone could dream of. So, who knows what the future of cruise ships can hold? We might even have entire cities floating around. Hmm, that would be a really big boat. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Once a famous giant, the largest ship of that time, now two grand pieces lying on the ocean bottom about 2,000 feet apart, torn by the catastrophic collision of time itself. The stern of the Titanic got completely ruined after hitting the ocean floor. But you can still recognize the bow since many interiors were left preserved. There's a type of bacteria found on the ship's rusticles. A rusticle is this brownish formation of rust. It occurs deep underwater when the wrought iron the ship is made of oxidizes. It means the bacteria eat the iron of the Titanic's hull, piece by piece. And it seems they might finish their snack by 2030, way sooner than when anyone would expect the wreck to be gone forever. You may think it would probably be easier to take the wreck out of the water so that we got to keep it, but it would fall apart if anyone tried to do that. It's been in the water for more than 110 years now and is now so rusty that no one would be able to reconstruct some parts even if we managed to get the ship out of the ocean depths. What do you think? Could any of about 700 people that had survived the sinking of the Titanic hear it hit the ocean bottom? The largest ship that had ever been made till then disappeared literally before their eyes after all. But sound most likely wouldn't have traveled from water to air. We can't hear that well in water because our bodies are not designed to hear in such environments. And although passengers were close to the sinking site, the Titanic still hit the bottom a long distance away, 12,500 feet. There are so many underwater landslides and earthquakes we cannot hear, and they make way more noise than a single ship slamming into the ocean floor. Most vibrations and sounds must have dispersed over a large area. Also, the down blast of water which many believe hit the Titanic after it had touched the bottom of the ocean 
would have pushed back the majority of the potential acoustic vibrations. Plus, the bottom of the ocean is not hard enough to produce such loud noises. Many survivors said they had heard terrifying noises as the Titanic was breaking apart, but none mentioned hearing anything after the ship disappeared below the surface of the water. Some survivors shared how chaotic it was when passengers, mainly women and children, were getting into lifeboats. There weren't enough boats, and still, some of them weren't even filled to their full capacity. No one knew how to react properly in such a situation. The lifeboat drill had been scheduled for the morning before the Titanic hit the iceberg, but for some reason, it got canceled. A giant ocean liner everyone believes is unsinkable takes a trip across the ocean. On its way, it strikes an iceberg and sinks. Yeah, we all know how the story goes. But what's scary is that it's also the plot of The Wreck of the Titan, a novel published in 1898, 14 years before the Titanic went to the ocean bottom or was even constructed. In the novel, the Titan, what a scarily accurate name too, didn't have enough life jackets, vests, and lifeboats for all the passengers on board. It was also the largest ship of that time, almost identical in size to the Titanic, and both the Titan and Titanic sank in April. Dorothy Gibson was an American silent film actress. She was also one of the Titanic passengers. She survived the catastrophe. Right after she came to New York, she started filming Saved from the Titanic. The film was released only one month after the ship sank. Dorothy was even wearing the same shoes and clothes she had worn when she had actually been on the ship. The movie was successful, but it got destroyed in a fire, so it only exists in memories, like Jack Dawson. Titanic wasn't all alone in the restless waves of the cold ocean near the iceberg it struck. The SS Californian was relatively close. Their radio was shut off for that night, though. At one moment, the crew members noticed mysterious lights in the sky. They immediately went to wake their captain up to tell him, but he issued no orders. Some believed it was just fireworks. They never realized it was actually a call for help. The flares, crew members of the Titanic sent off to the sky hoping someone would notice. By the time the SS Californian got the SOS message, it was already too late. Some say a full moon may have been the reason the iceberg crossed paths with the gigantic ship. A full moon may have caused incredibly strong tides that eventually sent multiple icebergs southward, right when the Titanic was crossing that area. Would you dare to taste cheese from the Titanic? The wreck has been under the ocean surface for more than 100 years now. It took more than 70 years to find it. By that time, most of the food that had gone down together with the ship had, of course, spoiled. But it's possible there's still some of it left. Some foods are protected from decay. For example, cheese. The microbes that turn milk into cheese create special conditions to protect the product from spoiling. Multiple things have survived the Titanic. A handwritten letter where a mother and a daughter wrote to the girl's grandma about the amazing journey they were on together. The letter has been around for more than 100 years and got sold at an auction. A battered pair of white cotton gloves was found in the wreck. Musicians on the Titanic played till the very last moment. Sheet music and one violin were found among the wreckage. The bell one of the crew members rang three times to warn there was a very close iceberg on their way. A pocket watch that stopped at 1.45 a.m., the time when the ship went under the water. Perhaps one person could have changed what happened on the Titanic. David Blair was a pretty lucky man. He was supposed to take the spot of the second officer of the Titanic. He was pulled out at the last moment, which eventually saved his life. It was a great thing for him, but something clouded his joy. What if he was the only person who could have done something to save the ship and the passengers? Back in the day, ships didn't have smart advanced technology like they do today. They couldn't see a threat on the horizon. Binoculars were pretty helpful, but the crew members on the Titanic didn't have access to the room where they were kept. David Blair was the man responsible for the keys. He left the ship in a hurry and forgot to hand over the keys that were in his pocket. 
Maybe if the crew members had had access to the binoculars, they would have seen the iceberg on time and had enough time to change course. It's possible that the giant iceberg that sent the Titanic to the ocean bottom was made of snow that had fallen in southwest Greenland. Scientists even used a computer model to calculate the paths the iceberg took in any given year, taking into consideration ocean currents and weather readings for that year. It's possible that the iceberg was 1,700 feet long, with a weight of around 75 tons. By the time it collided with the Titanic, it had dwindled down to only 1.5 tons. Violet Constance Jessup was, as many called her, Miss Unsinkable. She was only 24 years old when she joined the Titanic crew as a stewardess. On the tragic night when the ship struck the iceberg, she was lying in bed. As soon as she heard that something was going on, she got dressed and quickly went to the deck. Violet helped passengers get into lifeboats. Four years later, she was on the Britannic, the Titanic's sister ship. Once again, the ship started sinking. Not only did the woman survive another accident, but she was also once again the one helping other people to escape the vessel before it disappeared below the surface. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side. Two legendary athletes who shook up the tennis world had the unfortunate luck of meeting on the unsinkable ship Titanic in 1912. Without realizing it, they'd reunite on the tennis court where they'd be playing against each other. Here's how it all went down, twice. Richard Norris Williams was born in January of 1891 in Geneva. Although he was raised in Switzerland, his parents were American. In fact, he was a distant relative of Benjamin Franklin. In 1912, Williams was just 21 years old and was looking forward to his transatlantic trip to the States after being accepted to study history and geology at Harvard. But before his student life started, he had something else planned. He loved playing tennis and was quite the athlete. So he and his father decided to travel earlier than his mother in order to take part in a few tournaments. Williams and his dad took the train from Geneva to head to Cherbourg, France, where they would board the Titanic. On the way, Williams noticed a familiar face in one of the cars. It was another well-respected tennis player by the name of Carl Baer. The two locked eyes for a moment on the train, not realizing that fate was about to align their lives in an incredible way. Baer was 26 years old at the time. He was born in 1885 in Brooklyn, New York. He had already completed his studies at Yale in law. Two years before boarding the Titanic, he'd taken the bar exam. But you see, just like Williams, he also loved tennis a little too much. He'd already become famous in the tennis world for representing the United States in the 1907 Davis Cup Final. But unfortunately, he lost in the doubles final at Wimbledon that same year. But Bear was boarding the Titanic for a more personal reason than Williams. He'd fallen in love with his sister's friend, Helen Newsom, and was planning to marry her. But it wasn't that easy. Her family wasn't in favor of their relationship at all. Helen was from Ohio, and her parents had decided to take her on a grand European trip to separate the couple. But as soon as Carl found out, he rearranged his business schedule and joined Helen. After the European adventure was over, all of them were going to return to America together on the unsinkable ship. Bear was a first-class passenger and was given the cabin C-148. And Williams and his father were first-class passengers in the shelter deck. The tickets they bought for each suite cost 30 British pounds. And to put that into perspective, that equals $4,060 today. A few days after setting off, tragedy struck when the Titanic hit the iceberg. As the situation became clear, panic set in, and people were hastily instructed to get into the lifeboats. Carl Bear wasn't going to leave the side of his love, Miss Newsom, so he went with her and her parents to lifeboat number 5. Now, there was this priority boarding rule back then, that women and children had to go into the boats first. The last lifeboats, if there were any, would be filled with men. Bear and his companions met Bruce Ismay on the deck who was the managing director of the White Star Line that owned the Titanic. 
As soon as he saw them, he advised everyone to get into a lifeboat. This way Bear, who seemed like a muscular guy, could row the boat away with the rest of the gentlemen. Unfortunately, Williams had a more difficult evening. He and his father tried to guide as many passengers as they could into the lifeboats. Since most of them weren't leveled, they had to stand on the edge and help the survivors in. As they lowered the last one into the ocean, they made their way to the captain's bridge. At one point, they stood on the deck and glanced at the small lights in the lifeboats gliding in the distance. They were trying to figure out what to do, but the ship was beginning to sink and one of the giant funnels came off, hurtling towards Williams and his father. Desperately leaping out of the way, Williams plunged into the icy cold water. The funnel hit the water nearby, pushing him out further. He eventually found himself clinging onto one of the lifeboats that had been flipped upside down. It was collapsible A. At some point, Williams managed to climb onto the boat and stand on it. He was wearing a thick fur coat and shoes that he removed as soon as he got out of the water. After being in the freezing cold water for a few hours, he and a few other passengers were finally taken into lifeboat 14. Because they'd been submerged under the freezing water from the waist down for so long, all of the survivors from the collapsible needed medical care immediately. When the Carpathia ship arrived, Williams was taken on board. When the doctor looked at his legs, he was shocked. Williams was feeling sharp pains right below his knees, and his legs were a dark purple color. The doctor told him he'd need to have his legs amputated to save his life, but Williams refused. Coincidentally, Carl Bear was on board as well. Luckily, he was okay. He was helping the other survivors. That was when the two tennis legends finally met. William said that Bear had shown him great kindness. He felt more encouraged, so he began taking his first steps on the Carpathia deck. He didn't want his tennis career to be cut short, so he fought through the pain, got up every two hours, and walked around to get some circulation going in his legs. As time progressed, so did William's health condition. After they arrived in New York, he took some time off to recover completely. Six weeks later, he was back playing tennis. When the tournaments ended, he finally entered Harvard, and his tennis career thrived. From 1914 to 1916, he became the United States singles champion in tennis. In 1920, he became Wimbledon's doubles champion alongside Mr. Garland. And in 1924, he became an Olympic gold medalist in mixed doubles, managing to achieve it even with a sprained ankle. He had become so well-known throughout the years, the media started writing articles about his athletic achievements all over the world. The first time Bear and Williams would face each other in a match was in 1912, not long after their shared tragedy on the sinking ship. Bear was the champion of that game, and it was Williams' first defeat in America. After that match, he kept training, and two years later at the rematch, Williams would turn things around to become the champion. After he defeated Bear in the quarterfinals, Williams went on to take his title for the first time ever. He became one of the best tennis players of his time, winning the Davis Cup five times, the Wimbledon doubles, and the U.S. Nationals twice. Both of these legends were given a place in the International Tennis Hall of Fame. While tennis was a huge part of both men's lives, it wasn't the only success they found. After their sports careers were over, they both became remarkable financiers. Bear gave up on his career as a lawyer and became interested in banking. At one point, he became the director of an interchemical company. Interestingly, Williams also followed a similar path. He became an investment banker and was the president of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Many years after the incident, two books came out sharing the two men's stories on the Titanic. Nobody knew about their encounters or their friendship. The similarities between them were uncanny. It's what you'd call two peas in a pod. Neither of them cared much about their achievements in the tennis field. They just enjoyed playing. But they also never talked about the time they spent on the Titanic. April 12th, in the year 2212. It's a great date for humanity, the 300th anniversary of the launch of the legendary Titanic. 
The best engineers of the world have collaborated for years to bring their masterpiece to the public. The Space Tannic. And they've done it just in time. The glorious spaceship is waiting in its harbor under the limelight, photographed by thousands of people. The trip was scheduled for April 12, just like 300 years ago. Finally, the big day has come. The passengers are going on board the most magnificent spaceship of the time. They call it unbreachable. It has 12 decks, from the third class closer to the bottom, to the most luxurious first class on the top, with panoramic views of outer space. The ship is preparing for launch. The engines are starting, the final countdown has begun, and the Space Tannic is off into the sky. It quickly becomes no more than a speck in the big blue and then disappears. The first day of the flight goes perfectly. The ship leaves the Earth's atmosphere in less than an hour, and passengers enjoy the wonderful view outside. The blue and green planet on the backdrop of the black void of space. The ship slows down a bit as it moves into orbit. There are too many satellites and space debris circling around the Earth. The space Tannic has to go carefully and maneuver around the chunks of metal floating in zero-g. One of them heads straight towards the ship, but it turns on the side burners and moves out of the way just in time. The scrap floats by safely. Finally, the ship is out of the danger zone and into the big black. It turns on the back thrusters to accelerate and heads to the bright side of the moon. It's going to be the first destination of the sightseeing tour. The planet becomes gradually smaller behind, and about halfway to the natural satellite, people on board can marvel at the sight of the sun. The huge ball of burning plasma is bigger and brighter than ever in the cosmic darkness. Suddenly, the ship's captain makes an announcement. All passengers are invited to the promenade decks to watch as the solar panels are being unfolded. People go outside to goggle at the sight. The silver and black panels slowly emerge from their containment slots, and the space tannic finally takes its real form. As the sun's energy begins to flow into the ship, the thrust engines turn to minimum. The spaceship is now in energy-collecting mode. For the trip to Mars to take just a few days, it needs to make a transit jump. In another five hours, another announcement rings across the board. The ship is approaching the moon, and the passengers are invited to look at the satellite from up close. The space tannic passes by at several thousand miles, and the moon looks huge. All the craters on the satellite, even the smallest ones, are clearly visible. The view is outstanding. The moon is left behind, and lights on the ship go dim. There's no natural change of day and night in space, so the crew monitors the time and imitates the shift. The next day promises nothing of interest, as there's going to be a long traverse between the Moon and Mars. The passengers are wandering off to their cabins to sleep. The next two days go uneventful. On the decks, there are numerous types of entertainment for guests. From gyms and swimming pools to game rooms and dancing halls. People wander around the promenade decks, enjoying the serene views of space. Nothing bodes trouble. On the fourth day, the captain finally announces that the space tannic is preparing for the transit jump in 30 minutes. When the time comes, the passengers only feel a slight tug as the huge vessel leaps through space-time, entering the vicinity of Mars. Many passengers go outside to look at the red planet, which is already visible in the dark abyss. The tour is entering its final stage, but the landing is only planned for late night. At 11 p.m., when most passengers were already in their beds, the Space Tannic begins the final maneuvers. It has to make a little roundabout trip over Mars, because the port is on the other side of the planet. The flight is nearing its end, only a couple of hours left before landing. The ship is in the orbit on the far side of Mars. Everything's quiet. Too quiet. All of a sudden, an enormous boom thrashes the whole space tannic, 
throwing sleeping people out of their beds. Blinking emergency lights turn on, everyone's confused, but no announcement comes from the captain. And only those who have been on the starboard side promenade deck notice the horrible detail. The right front wing has been torn off and is zooming past them towards the stern. Pressing their faces to the glass, straining to look at the hull, they see a huge gash near the nose of the ship. The space tannic shudders again, and chunks of metal fly out of the gaping hole. The ship rapidly loses pressurization. Meanwhile, the broken-off wing hit the stern and left another gash in it. Mechanisms in the engine compartment start to fall apart and are dragged into space. The ship groans and comes to a halt, suspended thousands of miles above Mars. At last, the captain announces through the intercom that the space Tannic has unexpectedly collided with a rogue asteroid. All passengers are asked to proceed to their respective decks for evacuation. Within an hour, all rescue capsules are occupied and ready to be deployed. But about a third of the passengers are still on board the ship. It turns out many of the capsules were blown away at the collision. History seems to repeat itself. The captain still orders to deploy the capsules, and they whoosh out of containment tanks, leaving hundreds of people behind. Some left without their family members, not knowing what fate awaits them. The capsules float in space for a few seconds, and then turn on their thrust engines, heading to the Martian surface. Another order from the captain. Everyone is to go down to their cabins and put on pressurized suits stored under their beds. As the passengers rush to comply, the space Tannic sends distress signals to Mars and everyone in the vicinity. A hundred thousand miles away, a large trade ship, Leona, picks up the signal and hurries to help. The creaks and groans on board the space Tannic become more and more frantic. People are sitting silently in their cabins. It's quiet on board, except for the sounds of the slowly disintegrating ship. And then, suddenly, a loud snap resonates throughout the space Tannic, and the vessel cracks in two. A gigantic fracture goes from top to bottom, almost perfectly halfway across the decks. Pressurized glass covering the promenade decks shatter into millions of pieces, slowly flying away from the ship. With the decks depressurized, people and things are blown away into outer space. Thankfully, all of the passengers and crew are wearing their suits as ordered, but they only have about an hour before they run out of oxygen. People help each other by floating together and hauling stranded ones to their groups. They can barely control their floating, but somehow they still manage to bring some order to the chaos. Huddled together in orbit above the ominously red planet, they watch as the mighty space Tannic turns into a heaping pile of space debris. 45 minutes have passed. The oxygen is running low, and people try to breathe as slowly and carefully as they can. There's still no help in sight, and they're preparing for the worst. But then, one of them starts waving and pointing somewhere. It's a bright spot, hardly different from the stars in far space. But it's getting closer by the second. And within five minutes, the relieved people see a spaceship speeding towards them. The Leonas arrive just in time to save the day. Quickly, but without hurry, Leona's crew gather everyone floating in space around the remains of the space Tannic and haul them on board their ship. In a few hours, the Leona safely lands at Mars' main spaceport. The newspapers called it the day when the Titanic sank again. You know SOS, don't you? Three dots, three dashes, and three more dots. It's an easy enough signal to tap out in Morse code. It means save our souls or save our ship. The crew of the legendary Titanic had been desperately trying to send this signal for two hours the night of April 14, 1912. There were other ships not too far from the spot where the iceberg took down the mighty Titan of the Sea. But the call for help seemingly disappeared before it could reach them. The passenger ship SS Mount Temple did pick up a signal and try to respond, but the Titanic never got the answer. So what was silencing the ship's cries for help? Some unknown Bermuda Triangle of the North Atlantic? Consider this. 
Eyewitnesses say the sky was painted with a brilliant aurora borealis that cold, fateful night. Beautiful, yes. But on that day, the northern lights may have sealed Titanic's fate for good. You see, the aurora borealis forms thanks to geomagnetic storms. Sounds complicated, but those are basically fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic sphere. And what causes those is the Sun itself. The magnetic sphere is like a protective bubble that surrounds our planet. It blocks harmful solar rays, winds, and other cosmic dangers from reaching us. Without it, life on our planet wouldn't be possible. Earth would look more like Mars. You also have it to thank for compasses pointing north. Experts know the Earth's magnetosphere affects navigational equipment, or disrupts it. Which brings us back to the Titanic. Recently, a published weather researcher named Mila Zenkova proposed a theory that solar flares, which provoked a geomagnetic storm, could have played a major role in the Titanic's untimely demise. Solar flares make themselves known on Earth all the time. Some people are especially sensitive to the magnetic storms they cause. These unlucky folks can feel weakness, fatigue, headaches, and even mood swings. On usual days, the pressure is the same on both sides. The magnetosphere blocks all the bad stuff, and we're all happy. But sometimes, explosions occur on the sun. They can be massive, Earth-sized. These flares shoot out a wave of charged particles that collides with the magnetosphere at high speeds. Our protective bubble then goes on the defense. It shrinks, deforms, and pushes those particles toward the poles. Enter those brilliant lights dancing above the Titanic that night. In the north, we know it as Aurora Borealis. In the south, Aurora Australis, or the Southern Lights. When the magnetosphere pushes those solar and cosmic particles toward the poles, they collide with molecules of different gases. That's why you get the range of colors. For example, oxygen can be green or red, depending on the distance, and nitrogen is blue or purple. What multiple people saw that night was exactly this phenomenon, including the second officer from the rescue ship Carpathia. He wrote it down in the logbook before getting the distress call from the Titanic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Auroras are a visible sign of a geomagnetic storm. Now, about navigational equipment. This applies to satellite and radio frequency devices. Remember, they didn't have iPhones back in the Titanic days, so the average person couldn't notice their gadgets going haywire. But navigational devices and wireless telegraph did exist and were actively used. Rewind back to the Middle Ages, when sailors noticed that, on some days, compasses wigged out. The arrows spun in all directions, and people back then had no idea why. It wasn't until the 18th century when French scientists found out that such problematic days occur at the same time as black spots appearing on the sun. Solar flares. The mystery was solved. Now, the Titanic had the most advanced, well-known radio equipment at that time. They tested it thoroughly to make sure it worked for distances up to 2,000 miles away. Titanic's passed them all. On April 10, 1912, the massive liner left Southampton and set off for New York. The very next day, the crew started getting the first reports of drifting icebergs and ice fields. They put dots on the map to mark the coordinates and let out a sigh of relief. All the troublesome spots were north of the Titanic's planned route. But after a couple of days, the warnings were moving farther and farther south, encroaching on the majestic ship. On April 14th, Captain Edward Smith decided to change course to the south in hopes of bypassing the ice. This ended up being a huge mistake. Enter the magnetic storm. If it was throwing the navigation equipment off, even by a tiny error of half a degree, the captain could have been mistakenly taking the ship right toward a cluster of icebergs. What's even worse, the radio operators ignored warnings coming from other ships. That, or they simply forgot to hand them over to the captain. As hired contractors from the radio company, they were more interested in transmitting paid telegrams from passengers on that luxurious liner. The radio transmitter kept going out of order that evening, probably because of all this private traffic. When it was finally fixed, operator Jack Phillips received another message from the SS Californian at 10.30 p.m. 
Their operator was trying to warn Phillips about the coordinates of drifting icebergs, but he paid them no attention. He was nervous and in a hurry. Was the magnetic storm to blame for his frayed nerves and bad mood? We can only speculate. But as you know, some people are more sensitive to these things. The weather was fine, the ocean was calm, the water was smooth as glass. Despite all the warnings, the ship continued to sail at a maximum speed of over 22 knots. An hour later, Titanic collided with the infamous iceberg. On April 15th at 12.14 a.m., in the middle of the night, Titanic's operators started to transmit the first emergency signals. The SS Californian was sailing just 20 miles from the Titanic. They could have easily come to a quick rescue. But 10 minutes before the disaster, the Californian's radio operator had gone to bed. He was the only one who understood Morse code on the ship. According to this new theory, the magnetic anomalies possibly blocked Titanic's messages to other ships. For example, the steamer SS La Providence didn't receive any signals from the sinking ship at all. Yet they were still getting transmissions from another giant, the Olympic, which was 500 miles from the Titanic. That night, the signals were acting strange. They simply got lost somewhere in space. Or they were like a jumbled riddle, impossible to solve. The SS Mount Temple did get a message and rushed to Titanic's aid. But as fate would have it, the rescue ship got stuck in ice. She did arrive at Titanic's last known coordinates, but the luxury liner was nowhere to be seen. So were the coordinates accurate at all? The steamer Carpathia was about 60 miles away. At 12.30, their radio operator told the Titanic's crew they were rushing to help. The ship famous for coming to the aid, Carpathia, was going full steam ahead. But here's the odd part. At first, they headed to the wrong spot. The magnetic storm could have thrown its equipment off. Good news is the steamer did end up reaching the right place when they saw the lifeboats full of passengers. Interestingly, once she reached land, the Carpathia didn't have any problems with her equipment. The blackout happened just around the wreckage site. The following investigation blamed radio amateurs for blocking signals. We now might know otherwise. Zinkova explains that at that time, they didn't know exactly how and to what extent the sun influences the Earth. No one could have guessed that the sun could tamper with these massive ships' navigational equipment, especially one that had the best of the best at the time. There's another theory that even the moon could have played a role. Some researchers claim that in January 1912, our natural satellite was closer to the Earth than usual. It caused very strong tides and raised the sea level. Every year, icebergs break away from Greenland and stop around Newfoundland. But not that year. The increased water flow pushed them further for three months. And come April, they were right in the way of transatlantic ships. Unfortunately, it was a recipe for disaster when it came to the mighty Titanic. The Kraken is a colossal squid, a legendary sea monster, the biggest hunk of calamari you ever saw. And if this monster had existed, the world would have changed beyond recognition. The Kraken has powerful tentacles, solid muscles with suckers at the end. They're just impossible to escape. The Kraken can break a ship in half or just pull it down into the depths. But the worst thing about the Kraken is its size. According to old sailor stories, the Kraken reached 5,000 feet in length. That's almost 10 soccer fields. Hey, maybe the Kraken could play soccer. The Kraken legend said the monster was so giant that sailors mistook it for a small island. In past centuries, it would have been impossible to defeat such a beast. If the Kraken existed in reality, it might have had offspring. Yeah, in all the world's oceans, there would be giant monsters that could sink any ship. It's unlikely that the Kraken would have competitors in its habitat, so its population would grow strongly. Since the Kraken is enormous, it would need lots of food, so the population of other large sea animals would fall significantly. Blue whales, great white sharks, other giant squids, all the big sea creatures would be endangered. Many people are starving because of the reduction of large fish in the ocean. Urban economies that rely on fishing will be in decline. 
Prices for small fish around the world are getting more expensive because it's unsafe to fish. To defeat the kraken, you need powerful weapons, but the monster is tough to catch. The kraken belongs to the cephalopod genus. This species includes squid and octopus, some of the most intelligent creatures on the planet. The kraken is a skilled hunter and will never fight in the open. So what can you do? You can't track the kraken because it approaches from the depths, not the surface. Though you may be able to tell that the monster is somewhere nearby if a lot of fish surface. When the kraken swims, it scares all the fish in the vicinity. But it might already be too late. A huge tentacle emerges from the water, resembling a high tower. This tower falls on the deck of the ship, shattering it. The sailors scream and run. The kraken lands a second blow, and the vessel is almost capsized. Next, the kraken wraps its giant tentacles around the ship and pulls it to the bottom. Oh boy! What if the sailors manage to detach the ship from the tentacles of this monster? With the help of powerful weapons, the ship's crew strikes back. The kraken retreats under the water. It's hurt, angry. It seems the battle is over, but here comes the worst. A whirlpool forms beside the ship. Thanks to its considerable weight, when the kraken dives, it creates a whirlpool behind it. Like a drain in a giant bathtub, this whirlpool sucks the ship down. The battle with the kraken is lost. Well, that was unfortunate. You might be able to defeat the monster if you can anticipate its attack in advance. But the kraken can see you and your ship before you can see it. Colossal squids live in deep waters, and they have the largest eyes among all animals. The squid's eye is the size of a dinner plate. Thanks to this, they can see their prey from far away. Similarly, a kraken would spot the ship much sooner than sonar could pick up the kraken. It would always have the drop on you. Well, that's not good. Around the world, cargo transportation by ship is declining. Airlines provide the only safe connection between the continents. This will increase air pollution. The most successful enemy of the kraken is submarines. They travel at great depths and are equipped with powerful echolocators to help detect the kraken in advance. Subs are well-armed, too, and the round metal body is not so easy to destroy. A single kraken may be defeated by a submarine, but what if there are several sea monsters? Three kraken can wrap their tentacles around the submarine and drag it deeper into the water where the pressure will destroy their enemy. In other words, they'll have a crush on you. The existence of the Kraken will have dramatically changed the development of many countries. What if Christopher Columbus, on his famous journey, noticed an island that he thought was the New World? He approaches it, but tentacles emerge from the island and sink Columbus's ship. The colonization of North America is delayed, maybe until airplanes are invented. And the first crewed flight wasn't until the 20th century. There would be no Hollywood. There would be no hamburgers, no famous American music playing. There wouldn't be YouTube, which means you wouldn't be watching this video right now. Hmm. Worst of all, the internet wouldn't exist either. And all this because of one stupid monster squid. The Vikings wouldn't sail on their long ships to raid and settle foreign territories. The history of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and other Nordic countries would have changed drastically. Hey, maybe the Titanic wouldn't have hit an iceberg, but a giant sea monster instead. Though, it's unlikely that people would take trips on huge ocean liners in a world where the Kraken exists. Maybe, though, the Kraken isn't all that aggressive. Still, they need a lot of food, and because of the growing population of these monsters, there will be much less food in the ocean. Therefore, the Kraken will increasingly come to the surface for hunting. In the future, the Kraken will migrate closer to the shore. In many countries, people then are not allowed to swim in the ocean. Imagine floating on the waves and a monster the size of a skyscraper is swimming right below you. Relaxing at sea and on the beach will no longer be popular. Many countries that live off tourism become impoverished. When the krakens grow hungrier, they try to capture prey from land. A huge squid could attack small port cities. Houses, docks, streets, everything can be crushed. A tremendous amount of plastic is thrown into the ocean near the coasts of large countries. Billions of tons of plastic will bother the kraken. An angry, hungry monster can attack bridges like the Golden Gate Bridge. 
Imagine that a huge squid surrounds the bridge and blocks all traffic. Some of these squids could break the strong cables with their power, and the entire structure would collapse into the water. Ooh! It's good that the Kraken doesn't really exist to swim in our seas and oceans. At least, as far as we know. But could the monster have actually existed? Legends stretch back years, but scientific evidence appeared in the middle of the 19th century. In 1857, a 3-inch diameter squid beak was discovered on the coast of Denmark. Other huge squid remains were found in the Bahamas, and then scientists were convinced that gigantic squids existed. While colossal squid has been officially discovered since then, it's been more than 100 years, and we still don't know what max size they can grow to. The fact is, colossal squids are one of the most elusive creatures on Earth. They live in the depths of the ocean where it's challenging for scientists to reach. Any dive to a greater depth requires powerful, bulky equipment. Underwater bathyscapes and cameras make a lot of noise and light, which squids notice from afar. They flee before we can see them. The legend of the Kraken probably appeared because of a real colossal squid. People in the past didn't know about these creatures' existence, so when they saw one for the first time, They described it as a massive, terrible monster. It's difficult to say if these huge squids were the size of a small island, because the truth is, we've only studied about 5% of the ocean. It may be that in its depths, monsters much more terrible than the Kraken swim. Like my nephew, Peter. It was just a couple of hours before midnight. Some of the 2,200 passengers of a large, luxurious ocean liner were still partying in the beautiful first-class lounges. The rest were asleep in their beds. Some of them in spacious cabins filled with paintings and decorated with ornate carvings. Others in tiny rooms below sea level. All of these people had only one thing in common. On that chilly April night, all of them were heading from Southampton in England to New York City. The ship was called the Titanic, and at that time, it was considered unsinkable. At the very beginning of the journey, The liner nearly collided with the steamship New York. Luckily, the Titanic managed to pass by the other vessel with several feet to spare. A common sigh of relief escaped the passengers crowding the liner's decks. Little did they know what was awaiting them in the near future. Several days later, when the ship was already in the North Atlantic Ocean, 370 miles away from Newfoundland, the unthinkable happened. At about 11.40 p.m. on April 14th, Those who were still awake were knocked over by some mysterious and powerful force. Passengers who were already in their beds got catapulted to the floor. Screams and total confusion. Months before the disaster struck, a ginormous chunk of ice had broken away from a glacier in southwest Greenland. It was made of the snow that had fallen about 100,000 years ago, when mammoths were still roaming the planet. When the iceberg just started its journey, It was a huge thing. Almost 1,700 feet long, it also weighed 75 million tons. But then it floated much further to the south than normal, right into the area the Titanic had to cross on its way to North America. Even after melting into the water for months, the iceberg still weighed an impressive 1.5 million tons. Its top part was towering over the water for almost 100 feet. Even so, it looked harmless next to the massive ocean liner, but only at first glance. What people saw was just a tiny part of a jumbo piece of ice. The largest part of any iceberg is hidden under the surface, with a mere one-tenth visible above the water. The Titanic iceberg wasn't an exception. The moment the ship collided with it, the vessel was doomed. Unable to divert its course, it crashed into the ice, rupturing at least five of its hull compartments. They immediately started to fill with water, which then flooded each succeeding compartment. The front of the ship started to sink. This raised the back part almost vertically into the air. And then, with a deafening roar, the liner broke in half. The rest is history. But what if what we know about the disaster is not true? What if the ship hadn't been wrecked by an iceberg? What if it had been something more treacherous and way more alive that sank the Titanic? Far, far beneath the surface, in the ocean's dim, dark depths, a shadow lurks. 
Imagine an enormous creature, round, flat, and full of arms, or rather, powerful tentacles. It resembles a giant squid or octopus, but much, much bigger. Its descriptions go from as long as 10 ships to a mile and a half long. Rumor has it unlucky sailors sometimes mistake the sea monster for an island. But instead of stepping on dry land, they're dragged down into the ocean. These people meet the Kraken, a legendary creature feared by everyone who sets off on a sea voyage. Usually, the Kraken haunts the seas off the coast of Norway through Iceland and all the way to Greenland. Who knows what has brought the beast further away from home? The waters of the North Atlantic are just as chilly and the creature feels good and curious. Once it notices the Titanic, the ship has no chances to escape its attention. It's dark. That's why those on the ocean liner don't notice the first alarm bells. The water around the ship starts to bubble. If you strain your ears, you can hear bizarre gurgling sounds. If you strain your eyes, you can see thousands of fish and jellyfish rising to the surface. They feel something's up down below. But even if someone on the Titanic noticed this hectic activity, they wouldn't have time to get out of the way of the horrifying beast. Its enormous size and super long and strong tentacles turn it into a predator you can't escape. A nine-year-old boy standing on the deck knows nothing about the sea monster. He's just watching countless small islands rising out of the sea very, very slowly. The kid doesn't understand why, but all the blood in his body suddenly runs cold. Hundreds of tiny fish are leaping about in the pools between these sandbanks. But soon, they roll off into the water over the sides of the ginormous something. Several sharp points appear above the surface. The intrigued boy thinks they look like horns. They keep growing thicker and thicker the higher they rise. Soon, they're towering over the massive Titanic, dwarfing the ship. These horns are the Kraken's dreaded arms. The boy is paralyzed by fear. But then, he spots the monster's eye. It's as big as an elephant. It makes the kid come to his senses and dash away, screaming like there's no tomorrow. The boy's shouting attracts people. They gather along the ship's side, trying to spot what scared the child so much. And then, they see. First one, then more and more passengers and crew members lean over the railing to get a better look. They aren't being careless, they're just in shock. Indeed, it's hard to believe your eyes when they tell you a dreaded beast is about to attack the ship you're on. Plus, it's dark, and no one can see clearly what that huge shadow is. But the next several minutes prove it's not a mirage. All of a sudden, the creature rises one of its monstrous arms and stretches it toward the vessel. It might very well be longer than the liner's entire hull. Women start screaming and fainting. Men seem to be just as terrified. Those who have managed to keep their heads clear sweep up kids and run for shelter. That's when the first powerful hit shakes the vessel. The Kraken's had enough waiting. It's ready for action. Panic engulfs people on board the Titanic. Running around aimlessly and screaming, they create chaos that makes the beast even more interested. Normally, the monster just wants to be left alone. It rests deep down on the ocean floor, using its long tentacles to tether itself to the bottom and lazily hunt for food. It only rises to the surface when the weather's unusually warm, or when it gets disturbed. The Titanic is probably too massive and loud. It draws the creature out of its slumber. When the beast gets to the surface and sees a large, glistening boat, wow, the thing mesmerizes the creature. It holds out one of its tentacles to touch the unusual construction. The material is hard, and the beast wonders if the thing will break when squeezed. Without wasting much time, it wraps several arms around the ship and tries to squish it. Tiny creatures fussing around, falling overboard, and making annoying high-pitched noises start to irritate the Kraken. It's getting angry. Easing its grip, the monster circles the Titanic several times, getting ready for the next attack. This time, the strike is much stronger. It bends the metal and makes it brittle. One more movement of a deft tentacle, and the ship starts to fill with water. The Kraken retreats, as if to enjoy the results of its efforts. 
But then, it notices the ship trying to speed up in futile attempts to put some distance between itself and the monster. People on board the Titanic heave a sigh of relief. The beast is nowhere in sight. Little do they know that the Kraken never lets its toys get away. The ship is beginning to slow down. Its rear part is slowly lifting up, and the front is going down underwater. Passengers and crew members are falling over onto the decks. Most of them are too scared to make a sound. That's why everything's happening in almost complete eerie silence. Until the ship breaks into two parts under its own weight. The crash is so powerful that it scares away even the Kraken. Spooked, the beast dives back into the ocean, which creates a massive boiling whirlpool in that spot. The suction is dragging what's left of the Titanic to the depths of the ocean. The most tragic thing here, though, the Kraken isn't even interested in people on board the ship. This creature is content to munch on fish. It doesn't need bigger prey. It's the animal's curiosity that's now pulling the huge ship down to the bottom. Does the majestic liner have any hope? I think you know the answer. You remember those heartbreaking scenes from the Titanic, either from books or movies, right? You know, the ones where the boat was sinking, and there's nothing anyone could have done about it. Well, it turns out that that story isn't entirely true. At least, according to a historian and author of a book detailing events from that unlucky ship. If what he claims is true, every soul on the Titanic could have been saved. He wrote that the SS Californian and the SS Mount Temple were close enough to technically see the Titanic go down into the ocean, but they failed to act because they were afraid, or because they too had no idea what they were doing. Nobody thought the Titanic could ever sink back then, and it had everything you could imagine, from luxury lounges to a Turkish bath and even a squash court. But as it was racing through the ocean, ready to break the Atlantic crossing record, it hit an iceberg, and everything went downhill from there. A lot of ships wanted to help the sinking vessel and shifted their direction toward the Titanic after hearing the distress calls, but the two closest ships held back. The SS Mount Temple, for starters, was really close. It was a mere 50 miles away and could have reached the Titanic in just a couple of hours, potentially saving every passenger. However, its captain believed such a journey would be too risky. I mean, it did involve icebergs, right? There's nothing we can do about it these days, but we can use our imagination and at least save the day theoretically. Your average Joe might have had a difficult time helping people out on the Titanic, but what if we could ask for the help of superheroes? Well, for starters, it would be useful to have someone with time-traveling skills, right? They could go back in time and alert the crew that an iceberg is pretty close, and they should move the ship away from its path as soon as possible. Or, even better, go even further back in time and alert the captain of the ship not to proceed with the journey to begin with. Let me tell you, there were a lot of things that could have been done better with the Titanic. First of all, the crew had no access to binoculars. If they could have had this crucial piece of equipment, they might have spotted the iceberg in due course, at least limiting the damage or avoiding the collision altogether. And don't get me started on the lifeboats. Because they wanted the ship to look as luxurious as possible, there was little space left for those much-needed lifeboats that could have saved so many lives. Although there were 2,200 people on board, the lifeboats could only save 1,200 people. What about flight? Would a flying superhero have been able to help avoid this tragedy? I bet it would have. This superhero could have surveyed the area especially during the night when there's low visibility to begin with. More so, the hero might have helped with alerting nearby ships faster that something went wrong with the Titanic and that help yeah. is needed to make sure no one gets hurt. If someone on board might have been able to fly, maybe they could have airlifted a bunch of passengers to safety too. Laser vision? Now that would have been cool. A person with laser vision would have pulverized that iceberg in no time. Instead of shivering in the dark that fateful night in April 1912, 
people would have enjoyed a nice, chilled drink on the deck the next morning, courtesy of some harmless leftover ice still hanging around on the ship. Okay, okay, maybe this person with laser vision wouldn't have been powerful enough to split the iceberg in half so that the Titanic could pass safely. Well, they could have at least helped open the locked room containing the binoculars, that's for sure. Someone with superhuman strength. Yeah, that might have surely helped too. They could have placed themselves between the ship and the iceberg, preventing the collision from happening. If, say, they just happened to be snoozing when the Titanic hit the huge block of ice, no biggie. They would have simply kept the Titanic afloat until nearby ships came around to rescue all the people on board. If you'd have had underwater breathing abilities, you'd have at least been able to save yourself on the Titanic. I mean, technically, there's nothing much you could have done differently on the boat. Maybe you could have saved a bunch of other passengers, but only if you were strong enough to keep them afloat while you comfortably swam completely underwater. If a person on board had been able to control the elements, that would have been amazing. Not only would it have saved a lot, if not all, of the passengers, it would have been fascinating to watch. Such a superhero would have been able to keep water away from the Titanic's injuries after it hit the iceberg. If they were agile enough and had seen the iceberg before it hit the ship, they could have transformed the big block of ice into water with just the snap of a finger. If we look at the records from that night, everything happened very fast with the Titanic. Wouldn't it have been nice to have someone on board who could slow down time? For the sake of the story, let's also imagine this person had a finely tuned intuition. They could have sensed something was wrong by the way the air smelled, or by the reaction of the crew when the iceberg was first spotted. With a simple gesture of their hands, they would have slowed down time almost to the point of stillness. They could have checked the records from the ship, its unusually fast speed, and could have alerted the captain to decide in time. The Titanic could have been stopped, or it could have been diverted away from the iceberg. A superhero with night vision would have been useful too. At least the superhero would have spotted the iceberg sooner than everyone else. Given that the hero could have seen a lot better in low light conditions, that hero would have probably better managed the rescue efforts that disastrous night. Invisibility? Would this superpower have saved the Titanic from sinking to the bottom of the Atlantic? I could think of a possible scenario or two. Anyone with the power to become invisible whenever they want to would have probably gone snooping around the ship. I mean, you have to remember, the Titanic had some of the most important members of society on board. It wasn't just any regular boat. It was probably buzzing with the latest gossip. In between all that mundane information, this superhero could have overheard the captain saying they were going faster than they should have, or that there weren't enough lifeboats to save everyone in case there was a major problem. Who knows what this curious superhero might have done with all this information. Some sort of sorcerer would have saved the Titanic if they were on board, I'm sure. There has to be some sort of magic spell in a book out there that's useful for sinking ships, right? Maybe one that could have helped weld the metal back together after it got hit by the iceberg. Or maybe one that could have airlifted the entire vessel to safety after it got hit. How about a spell that would have transformed the Titanic into a submarine, creating a protective layer around it so it could comfortably move under the sea? That surely would have been cool and would have offered passengers a truly unique experience. The ability to speak to animals or fish would have certainly been useful too. Even if all else failed, so the Titanic would have still struck the iceberg and it would have still been filled with water and ended up near the seabed, people could have still been saved. That's because you'd have had someone on board who could have instructed dolphins to carry people to safety. I'm sure those intelligent creatures would have been happy to help. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you